Okay, our last speaker of this event is our newly elected state senator who knows, uh, who is known across the state as being a champion for Florida's children. She lists strengthening our schools as a main priority on her website and her legislative history proves it. She's focused on the future and is ready to facilitate some important changes in her new Senate position. Get your questions ready and please join me in welcoming Senator Lauren Osley. Senator. Thank you so much. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Sounds like y'all have had a great agenda with some of my old friends. Um, my my incredible predecessor, Senator Mumford, I, I, I think he was on your agenda earlier. And Robin Safley, who's a, actually, a, we, we graduated from high school together and I've watched her career and watched the great things that she's done um, with the school nutrition program and now at Beating Florida. Uh, so um, such an important time for that organization. Uh, so I am honored to be here and to be, uh, have, have been elected as the Senator for Senate District 3. Um, Senate District 3, as you all may know, is the one of, I think it's got to be the largest, uh, in ge largest geographic district in the, in the state. It's 11 counties, so the urban center of Leon, but then the 10 surrounding counties going all the way to the east to Hamilton County and to the west to Gulf. So 140 miles of, of coastline, eight first magnitude springs, 12 rivers, something like 23 state parks. So a huge environmental, um, a lot of environmental needs in this district. And obviously just the, the challenges that come from a district that is has an urban core, but 10 rural districts. And you know, so that means I have 11 school superintendents, 11 sheriffs, 11 ca county commissions, a lot more than that, more than 11 city, city commissions. Um, and I'm and I'm really enjoying in a very you know it's as challenging as it is during a pandemic, um, getting around the district. We've had a delegation meeting in every in every county. Um, I met with the Panhandle Area Education Consortium superintendents last a couple of weeks ago, um, and sort of got their priorities from the rural superintendent perspective. Um, so I listen. I, the, I and I, I'm just gonna. I want to kind of just lay out what I what I think are the big issues this session and some of my priorities, and then I really want to open it up for questions. Um, so obviously, we just I, I just finished watching the budget presentation from the um, the governor's office to the Senate Appropriations Committee. I watched it on Zoom and. Um, you know, it's a $96 billion budget. And so I think we're still sort of parsing through that. My appropriations committees are um, agriculture and environment and transportation and tourism and economic development. Um, so that's where I'm going to be able to dig in. But obviously the things that we care about on this call are, our, you know, our education system. Um, the real issue that we're all facing, there's just, you know, is, is COVID and how do we, how do we deal with the health crisis and an equitable distribution of vaccines, which I think should include our frontline school employees. Um, and, and how do we, and how do we bolster our public health departments who we are, who we are stressing, we've already completely, you know, diminished their budgets over the past 20 years. And now we're asking them to save the world by asking them to give us, to, to, to roll out this vaccine in an equitable manner and hard to serve areas. And it's hard. Um, and our public health workers are overworked. Um, so, you know, those are the, the, you know, the health crisis and then the, the associated economic crisis that we are all dealing with. It's impacting every, everyone. Um, so, you know how how does our how our school districts deal with this? How do our how do our um, you know every aspect of our lives are are dealing with a health crisis and an economic crisis? And in, in underscoring all of that, we're in the middle of this sort of sort of social justice reckoning um, across our country. So this is not, you know I, I think President Biden has said it. It's not just one crisis. We're facing three simultaneous crises at the same time. And so how our state responds to that. Uh, this is the, 
we were one of the only of one of the, I think seven states that haven't met in session since the pandemic began, um, and the governor's office has had a huge um, leeway in in this in the the spending of the dollars. So today, being the first day that we've seen that budget, it's it's going to be real interesting to dig in and find out um, exactly where the CARES Act dollar CARES Act dollars have gone and um, how do we then pick up and, and move forward. Um, so my, my sort of top, I, I'm so sitting also sit on the select committee on the pandemic. So um, to me, that committee is going to address sort of everything that we need to be addressing. And so, I mean, my, my list is, you know, starting with dealing with a pandemic, Equitably, equitably distributing vaccines. I represent Gadsden County. It's the only majority minority county in the state. Um, we know that this, this disease is impacting communities of color at a much higher rate. We also know that com communities of color are less likely to or, or have some skepticism about the vaccine and have more difficulty ac accessing the vaccine. So I believe it is incumbent upon us as a state to make sure that we are reaching out to those hard to reach communities in creative ways. In Gadsden County, I'm really pushing for a mobile vaccine unit um, because there's no way, there's six incorporated communities in Gadsden County um, that, and there is a large, large community and not everybody can get to the health department. And that's, if we can get it done in Gadsden County, we can show how to do it across the state. Um, and then beyond that, just sort of the basic needs. I mean, you all know more than anyone, our base, you know, food and shelter. You all understand the importance of food and, and the, the, the increasing numbers of food insecurity in our, in our state. Uh, and the, you know, the Robin and um, Feeding Florida uh, presented to our committee earlier this week or last week and just talked about the staggering numbers of, of so many people that are showing up and the food lines that have never, ever been in that position before. We all see it with our kids, you, you know, we, we saw it with our kids before, um, but I, I, you know, making sure that we are set up to continue, uh, it, you know, we, we can't put all of the burden on the schools, but y'all, you know, the schools are the, the catchment area where our families are. And I, you know, I, I really, my first memory of the of the um, of COVID was the food bank here in Leon County, Second Harvest, just jumping in with our school district and all of our everybody from the principal down to the cafeteria workers were loading up those bags and getting them ready for the first um, first drive through event and how everybody came together to do what they needed to do to make sure our families had the food that they needed. We've got to have systems and, and robust systems to make sure that that, is, that, you know, that those needs that we have now um, are still met. Uh, you know, there's a lot of issues with shelter and with, with landlord tenants and evictions and there'll, you'll be, see some issues around that. Um, just general education issues. And I'd love to hear from y'all. What I heard from the principals is concerns about enrollment, these kids that we don't know where they are. Um, um, and lots of mental health issues that have were, again, we had those before, but the, uh, COVID has really exacerbated that, um, that mental health needs, um, and of course, distance learning. So one of my key priorities has been and will be uh, a digital, closing the digital divide, making sure that every single person in the state of Florida has access to, to not just, you know, broadband, but accessible and hot, reliable uh, internet access. We now know there's nobody has to, I don't think anybody has to be convinced about the, the need for that, for, for education purposes, for health purposes, for, uh, for, you know, for work purposes, um, for, for economic development in these small communities. I believe there's a lot of people that are gonna to wanna to move out of large cities, but they're not gonna go somewhere if there's no internet. Uh, so we have got to take advantage of the federal resources and be prepared as a state to, uh, to, to build out, do what we need to do to make sure all of our communities have access to the internet. Um, I mentioned our public health system. I believe we really need to look at our public health system and going forward, how do we bolster that um, if we're going to ask them to distribute, you know, be the distribution mechanism for healthcare and vaccines, we need to support them with that. Um, Childcare. So I'm anyone who's watched my my career knows that early learning is a really important, um, really really 
key piece for me. And I think any of y'all who are, are, are in the school systems know that you're, you know, you're only as good as that raw material that shows up on the first day of kindergarten. And we don't have a strong system of early learning in the state of Florida. We have a president and President Biden who wants to make a commitment to uh, to invest in those early years. And again, I think we need to be ready to um, be able to, to, to leverage those federal dollars to really build up our early learning system. And, and we, if nothing, if there, you know, if we didn't learn anything else, we know just like uh, broadband, childcare is essential to getting our economy back to work. I want to make sure that we are, um, that we're not just talking about filling slots. We're talking about quality slots that every kid has an access, has the ability to have an early learning, a quality early learning experience. Last two issues, um, that I believe we need to focus on are the transparency around the COVID numbers um, and the vaccines and the CARES Act dollars. And so I'll be digging into that to figure out exactly where those dollars have gone. And finally, I, I represent Leon County, which is um, you know, the largest concentration of public employees. And I wanna make sure that we are thinking about those those folks who've been on the front line as far as their leave policies, the retirement system, um, and, and you know, some consistency across our agencies uh, as far as th this pandemic is concerned and moving forward. So I've thrown a lot at you, um, but I'd love to, uh, I'd love to hear from y'all and answer your questions and, and hear what your priorities are. Hi, Lauren, this is Tim Tankersley. I happen to be your one constituent on this call. At least I know I am. There may be a couple others, but uh, you mentioned the care um, dollars that the legislature is looking at. Uh, I would hope that the legislature will keep it in mind that the tremendous economic burden that has gone on to the school food service programs, um, and you know, once they if they lose money, they still feed the kids, but then they have to take education dollars to supplement it. And, and we run it, it strangely, we run a for-profit nonprofit in our school food service. We can't lose money because we can't use education dollars. It just wouldn't be right. But in this case, many districts are, are suffering from that. And I hope the legislature will look at those care dollars and ad, ad, um, advocate some of them towards school food service programs. Well, if not, I mean, if nothing else, again, this, this is one of the areas which there's no denying how critical, what a critical piece of this whole process, the school, school food service has been, um, as I'm, you know, I, I still have that, that visual memory of packing those, those lunches and, tr and, and just trying to figure out all of the, the, um, you know, the challenges and barriers that were presented with, and, and everybody figured it out. Um, so we shouldn't punish y'all uh, for doing doing what needed to be done in the way that it needed to be done. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ossie, it's Martina here. I work here at FSNA. What do you suggest to us is the best way to communicate with legislators about the losses that we've suffered? We we just, you know, we know that that folks like you sort of understand that already, but there are some that maybe don't understand. They don't understand the reimbursement system and like how, if we did a video, how long should it be? If we did a page, how long should it be? How should we communicate that? Well, it's a good question now because this whole process is so different this this year with everything, you know, like it is for everybody, um, everything by Zoom uh, and even the you know, we don't know whether people are going to be able to allow in the Capitol during even during session at this point. Um, and I'm sure Diana has has explained to y'all, but right now, even for committee meetings in the Senate, people, you know, if you're presenting, you you don't come into the Capitol, you go to the Civic Center and you and it's it's good. It's very and and we are I don't know what the House and, and the Senate have different a um, little bit of different protocols around COVID, which is problematic for me since we're all in the same building it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have different rules but um, but I feel I feel like the Senate is much more um, is really taking this very seriously and um, and so we are not right now even authorized to have meetings inside even with anybody inside the building um, and I've been 
maybe we'll come kind of laugh about it, but I've been suggesting that we really should have a, a lot of outside tables and allow people to come meet with their legislator like in outside in this when it's safe and you know on a pretty day and um you know and and be able to have some type of access because i'm, I'm worried frankly about the limited access so in with that context i think um i don't know a, a video a, a one pager or something with that just very succinctly explains the the just the the what the situation is and what the ask is um you know as busy as we get during in these committee weeks and during session just having somebody come talk about something that's we're not going to vote on or that's you know that's not in immediate is we, well we want to hear those things when it's getting down to the crunch time what we need to know is what is the situation and what is the ask and i think as so if you can be as clear as possible about that um that is very helpful Senator Ossley, this is Roy Pistoni. I'm our FSNA president. Um, one of the things we've heard from our local food service programs is the concern of what our uh, voters have approved, which is uh, the minimum wage. Obviously, we're a federal program. That's where we receive majority of our dollars is at the federal level. However, to think about continuing to raise the minimum wage, which I don't believe there's anybody on this call that is opposed to that. But when you were receiving pennies uh, each year in order to provide food to children, especially right now during our pandemic where costs have gone up and our business partners have eliminated products. So we're scrambling on how we make this all work and the amount of dollars that we've lost now. That's a big concern for us because if it's mandated, how do we make this all work and still provide that uh, minimum wage where we're looking to get to $15 in the next several years? And I believe this is gonna take us several years to get out of this when we're all competing for dollars. Well, you're not alone in those concerns. Um, and you know, the, the, the business community and the chamber who have very strong voices um, are being, are, are, are using those voices. Um, and, and so I, my guess is um, like so many things that even though the voters said, A, we're gonna probably, the legislature is probably gonna end up doing B um, or at least, you know, so, I mean, it does have to be, implemented and that will be a, a conversation and I you know I think the pandemic and these sorts of issues will certainly be um, front of mind in in those discussions so and I think you know making that point in your you know in your list of asks is important thank you Okay, do we have any other questions that are out there? Okay, Senator Osley, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and being part of this uh, Legislative Action Caucus. And we know we can count on you uh, to help our school nutrition programs both now and in the future. And we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And please, you know, we have an open door, whether you live in my district or not, um, we want to want to be a partner in helping you all do the, the great work that you do. So thank you so much. And um, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you thank for you. coming and joining us. Thanks. Okay. Um, I know we're a little bit early, so I, I don't think anybody is opposed to that if we ended a little bit early. Uh, so um, that marks the end of our Florida School Nutrition Association's 44th Annual Le Legislative Action Caucus. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank our wonderful sponsors and our guest speakers. And uh, definitely, um, I can't thank our public policy and legislative committee members for helping to put this on, especially uh, our chairperson, uh, Tim, uh, who I've known for so many years. And uh, I always ask him, are you enjoying your retirement? And uh, he is, but he, all you got to do is pick up the phone and ask Tim. And he just, he lives school nutrition. 
and uh, he just has my utmost respect and appreciation for what he continues to do for all of us when it comes to school nutrition. So, uh, Tim, I'm going to leave it up to you to kind of close us out. Any thoughts that you have? And uh, we'll go forward from there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can. This is not Jess, as it may say on there. Uh, my computer dropped off, so I'm sitting at hers. Um, I think, I'm not sure if you even heard what I started saying. Uh, no. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody on this call for your, your support of this critical mission of uh, feeding the children. I mean, with all the uncertainties and the challenges and the unknowns this past year, the school nutrition men and women down there in the in what I call the front lines, the cafeterias, uh, have stepped up and they've really done. You've done, you as uh, some of the leaders have done some innovative things, and everybody has been dedicated to taking care of our kids. I especially want to thank the FSNA staff for this uh, effort that they put on to put bring this on. Um, I basically just had to do what Jess told me. That was that was about it. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how well that they have and hard they have worked at getting this put together. And I don't know where we would be without them truly. I wanna thank each, each of them for what they do for each of us as members of this association. And I'm, I'm not gonna name all four, but I, yeah, I will. Martina, Arby Lee, Jess and Beth. But um, all of you, thank you so much. Uh, I, I could go on and on with, with what you've been doing. But with that, unless anybody has a final comment, we will close this meeting and we will stay in touch as the session goes along. Please watch for um, additional emails coming out and post and the FSA tidbits, FSNA tidbits. With that, thank you so much. Stay safe. <laughs>